every day, actually every hour that passes without the authors of the original paper just stepping up and saying, hey, here are five samples and here's a video of them levitating makes me far more suspicious that this is either a hoax or it is such an incomplete product that really doesn't work as a superconductor in most cases that they're embarrassed to just come out and say it. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't we already have superconductive materials at the 90, 100 Kelvin range? I kind of stand by my original guess that they're not fraudsters, but they don't quite yet have a mass producible room temperature superconductor. So there are some severe flaws with what they do have, and they've been tinkering around trying to fix them, haven't been able to. And then the new guy basically jumped the gun on making the announcement because he wanted the rest of the world to see it, and he wanted to be uh, on the Nobel <laughs> Prize recipient list. At this point, I think the most likely outcome is not that we're going to have a working mass-producible room temperature superconductor anytime soon, but rather that we're going to open up a new uh, subtopic and area of research in material science to uh, explore some of the interesting results that come out of this novel material. When you choose an auto mechanic, you rely on all sorts of less lower quality explanations. You ask for people around town who's good. You check out their ratings on Google. You um, you call and ask for an estimate. You see what they're talking about. Do they sound? You know, do they strike you as being creepy. Um, you ask people who've already had their cars worked on by that auto mechanic, you know, what was it like? What was your experience? You ask some hard questions like, you know, instead of saying, did you like it? You say, you know, did it cost more or less than you expected? Is your car still working? So there's all sorts of ways to um, kind of challenge and criticize uh, claims that are again, of lower quality than a kind of gold standard uh, evaluation or explanation. And I think that's a really useful skill in life, and it's also fun. So that's what I think this is. And um, again, personally, it all comes down to the samples in this case. And I think that's the best quality criticism that can be levied at this whole project, right? And all the stories of some Chinese lab getting a rock to levitate a little bit on a video, right? That, you know, anybody can post something like looks like that on Twitter. That's very easy to do, very easy to vary. Um, what, I, what I think is hard to vary, hard to explain away, is why these guys haven't released a bunch of samples or invited somebody to come test the samples that they have. Um, hold a press release. You know, they've had, they've had over a week at this point. So... I think that is a massive problem and it's so powerful compared to everything else that I think uh, I think it outweighs everything else at this point. The trap that is laid here is the tendency to stack up evidence and the more, you know, the weight of evidence increases the probability that the claim is true and that whole project is flawed and you can see that happening here this is kind of a perfect example of that, right? Twitter is going to amplify the extraordinary... Twitter is going to amplify the extraordinary claims because the extraordinary claims, are obviously, are much more interesting. And so those are going to keep rolling in, and the viewer is going to keep on thinking that, wow, this lab and that lab and this lab and that lab have confirmed, and there's this theoretical work that confirmed, 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 and now I'm convinced this is the real deal. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's easy to find... Uh, well, there's no such thing as a confirmation. And there's all sorts of reasons that we're unaware of that could amplify seeming confirmations. Kind of the same thing with these Doomer macroeconomic Doomer guys who uh, tell you how, you know, the dollar is going to fail and the global financial system is going to collapse. and Right? And they always have all these long strings of evidence, right? And they can just hit you with evidence after evidence after evidence. You know, the war in Ukraine did this to grain prices and did that to fuel prices and did this to this and that to that and the fertilizer and around and around you go. And the next thing you know, China's going to collapse and there goes our, you know, manufacturing and then blah, 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 blah. And 
what's really going on is that the world, you know, the macroeconomic world is just extraordinarily complicated. There's millions and millions and millions of interacting factors going on. And it's very easy to pick out and select narratives and then, you know, add on more and more evidence to that narrative and make this compelling story that is, uh, in the end, worthless. So I think a similar thing is happening with, you know, material science. I mean, how many different elements are there that can be combined and how many different, you know, arrangements at different temperatures and pressures and, um, you know, doped with this and that. I mean, it's just astronomical. And so it's easy to kind of um, talk yourself through a thread of evidence that sounds plausible. I guess you'd say constructing a narrative is much easier than actually finding uh, a novel substance that matters. And then I'd also say the same thing with uh, human metabolism. It's easy to say that, oh, you know, this enzyme and this biomarker and this macronutrient, and if I eat this diet and sleep like this, then that causes that and this raises that, right? So um, the narratives are really easy in these complex spaces and just the narrative alone. The narrative can seem like it stacks up evidence and is confirmatory when it's not. Uh, there, I guess that's my piece. But I'm rooting for you, Alex, and uh, everybody else. And I think it's really awesome that you're compiling all this stuff. And uh, it is all very fascinating, very interesting. I've learned a lot. It's been fun. And uh, I hope I didn't just uh, call it too soon. Uh, for the sake of argument, I want to take the other side of this. Um, it's easy to criticize. It's easy to be unpatient. Uh, but basically, what do these guys owe to us? Nothing. Uh, it looks like that uh, this got out of hand uh, without intent to go out. So they didn't want to have a PR release. They didn't prepare to do this. So they are, they are not up for this thing. Probably the materials are not ready. The papers are not ready because they were rushed to do the leak. So all the stuff uh, they've been doing is for decades now. And uh, we expect them to have everything lined up and ready and uh, adopted to the T. Uh, and why? Because we cannot wait. And what if it doesn't work out? Well, it's on then. It's anyways about the, the physics, the, the reality of the, the matter, whether it works or not. So if we've been waiting for decades, centuries already, what does it matter? And if it doesn't pan out, that's it. I don't think uh, these guys are, they are not professionals in PR marketing, BS. They, they, are, they are not going out. They haven't done that. So it's all social media. It's all the rest of us who are actually making all this fuss. This interview was published uh, earlier today, and uh, I, I got to know it uh, from Alex's Twitter spaces, which was live um, just uh, an hour ago. And uh, yeah, if they're not looking for verification, at least one of these uh, authors who is uh, among those six, um, it tells something. Not sure exactly what. I agree. They're not fraudsters. But then again, the cold fusion guys weren't. It doesn't seem to me they were initially fraudsters either. They honestly believed they'd done cold fusion. I think these guys are honestly out there and, you know, fully honestly thinking that they've done something. But now that I've read the papers and I've read the commentary, I think I'm willing to, you know, forced to place a bet. I think I'd be willing to place a bet now. And my bet would be it's just an error. It's just prosaic magnetism of a sort. You're getting levitation based on some kind of induction effect. Uh, these guys apparently aren't experts in superconductivity. They're experts in a, an allied area, but not actually in superconductivity. It does seem remarkable, and it's so remarkable, so astonishing, that you really need a really good explanation for this kind of thing. So I think they're honest. They're reporting their findings. They don't understand what they're doing. And I think they're just making an error. That would be where I'd be placing my money right now is that it's going to turn out to be just a, a straightforward error of some kind. Can't say what exactly, but, you know, again, it's kind of in the same category as the UAP stuff. 
Not exactly. I know people get angry <laughs> you know, when you say that kind of thing. But in, in the same category, from the perspective of what we've got as an observation that's difficult to explain. So you've either got to say, okay, is it someone just making a mistake here? Or have we actually got evidence of something truly astonishing? You know, is it truly aliens from the other side of the galaxy? That would be amazing. Is it truly not merely a room temperature superconductor, but a, a superconductor that is apparently operating even at, you know, 100, 127 degrees Celsius? That's astonishing sort of stuff. So, or is it just a mistake? So, mm, yeah, I'm, I'm unfortunately, you know, going to bet on it's a mistake. <laughs>